Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Alex Halliday. I'm the new director of the Earth Institute here at Columbia. I've been in New York for six months, and it's fantastic, having a brilliant time. And uh, uh, it's great to be here today, but it's also great for me to introduce uh, one of my former colleagues in the US and in the UK, and in the Royal Society, Martin Rees. Um, uh, Martin Rees, who is um, Baron Rees of Ludlow, as we say in our quaint terms in the UK, uh, is a world-leading astrophysicist and a former president of the Royal Society. He's also the United Kingdom's Astronomer Royal, uh, which is a pretty big job which goes back several centuries. Uh, Martin has conducted uh, influential theoretical work on subjects as diverse as black hole formation and extragalactic radio sources. Uh, he's provided key evidence to contradict the steady state theory on the evolution of the universe. He was also one of the first to predict the uneven distribution of matter in the universe and proposed observational tests to determine the clusterings of stars and galaxies. Much of his valuable research has focused on the end of the so-called cosmic dark ages, uh, a period shortly after the Big Bang when the universe was as yet without light. Martin and his research have been recognized and honored by many leading, or leading organizations. Among other awards, he is a recipient of the Balzan Prize and the Crawford Prize, which is the Nobel Prize equivalent. Um, he has been increasingly concerned about issues to do with our long-term global outlook. Um, the pressures that are growing and more demanding population are placing on the environment, sustainability, and biodiversity all issues that are of incredible importance to the Earth Institute, which is why I invited him to come and speak here today. Uh, in 2015, he was co-author of the report that launched the Global Apollo Program, which calls for developed nations to commit to spending 0.02% of GDP for 10 years to fund coordinated research to make carbon-free baseload electricity less costly than electricity from coal by the year 2025. He is known as a brilliant speaker and writer. I shouldn't say that before he speaks, but anyway. <laughs> um, and he's authored several books on popular science. His newest book on the future prospects for humanity will be the theme of today's talk. And after the talk, um, the book will be available for purchase. There's 40 copies there at the back. And Martin will be available to sign copies if you want them signed. So thank you all of you for being here, and please uh, give a warm welcome to Lord Martin Rees. Well, thank you, Alex. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I wish you the best of luck in your uh, new surroundings in this country. Um, uh, it's a great privilege to have the chance to talk to this audience. Um, you mentioned I was an astronomer royal. And uh, I'm sometimes asked, do I do the Queen's horoscopes? <laughs> um, and uh, I have to say that uh, um, I haven't been asked, um, but I was asked once by some tycoon this, and he wanted my predictions. And I said, well, stock markets will fluctuate, there'll be trouble in the Middle East, and insights like that. And he listened sagely. But then I came clean. I said, I'm only an astronomer. And he then lost all interest in my predictions. And quite rightly so, because uh, scientists are pretty rotten forecasters, although not quite as bad as economists, I would say. <laughs> well, uh, what I'm going to do is to offer some forecasts and some hopes and fears about new technology here on Earth and then in space beyond. My main theme is that this century is special. It's the first when one species namely our species, has the planet's future in its hands. We're deep in an era called the Anthropocene, when we could irreversibly degrade the biosphere, or we could trigger the transition from biological to electronic intelligence. Or misdirected technology, bio or cyber, could cause some catastrophic setback. And these are the themes of my new book um, on, the on the future, uh, which you can buy afterwards at the back. Well, even with a cloudy crystal ball, there are some things we can predict 50 years ahead. Let me mention two of these. The first is that the world will get more crowded. Population is going up. This picture, distorted map, shows where the growth of population has been concentrated in the last 30 years, mainly in East Asia 
and in Africa. And 50 years ago, the population of the world was about 3.5 billion. It's now 7.6 billion. Now, the number of births worldwide has actually peaked, and only in Africa and parts of India is it still high. But the population is going to rise to 9 billion by mid-century, uh, partly because of this histogram. This shows the age distribution of the present population in West Africa compared to that in Europe. And fortunately, the life expectancy of children in Africa is now much better, so this uh, uh, histogram, uh, even if it doesn't get any wider at the bottom, is going to fill out, and that's the cause of the doubling in Africa's population, which is expected between now and 2050. And uh, that is going to be a big uh, uh, geopolitical challenge uh, to the um, doubling of Africa's population. Not just feeding everyone. I think most people think that 9 billion people can be fed uh, with uh, improved agriculture, um, low-till water conserving and GM crops, and maybe also dietary innovations. We can't all eat as much uh, beef as Americans do today. Um, nor use as much energy, but of course we have to realise that insects are highly nutritious and rich in proteins and they can be made palatable and we can hope perhaps for artificial meat, that's a very important technology. To quote Gandhi, there's enough for everyone's need but not for everyone's greed. But I think the issue of getting Africa out of the poverty trap is going to be really crucial uh, for the stability of the world but I don't have time to go into that now. Moreover, if humanity's collective impact pushes too hard on the climate and on land and resources, the resultant ecological shock could irreversibly impoverish our biosphere. Extinction rates are rising. We're destroying the book of life before we've read it. And to quote E.O. Wilson, if our actions cause mass extinction, is the sin that future generations will least forgive us for. So that's a concern. Another thing we can predict, 50 years ahead, is that the world's getting warmer. The effect of rising CO2 emissions, which is uh, very familiar. And this is a big political challenge, um, and uh, politicians find it hard because they tend to focus on the local and the short term, whereas this involves thinking about people 50 years in the future in different parts of the world. And I think that even those who agree on the science differ on policy implications because they differ in the ethics and the economics. If you take a standard discount rate, 5%, then you don't care what happens after 2050. And that's why Lomberg and his economics colleagues, they don't rate the priority of climate change as high as of helping the world's poor in other more immediate ways. But if you think that in this context we should not apply a high discount rate and that we should care about the life cycle of babies born today, then you do feel it's worth paying an insurance premium now to remove a potential risk at the end of a century from worst case climatic predict predictions. Well, um, Alex mentioned the so-called Apollo project, which now has a different name, and this was what I think is the uh, only realistic way in which we can deal with climate change, and that's to promote faster research and development into all forms of clean energy and into batteries and all the other things, in the hope that they will become more efficient and their cost will come down, so that countries like India, where they now get energy by burning smoke burning wood and dung on smoky stoves they need a power grid but they will use coal unless they can afford a clean alternative so the crucial thing is to boost r and d so that the cost and quality of clean energy drops so that india and similar countries can leapfrog directly to clean energy so to support all kinds of clean energy um, is, uh, I think, the only realistic way. It's a win-win situation. It's a winner for the countries which innovate and also for the countries which then use it. But 
if 20 years from now it's clear we're not making progress, then there'll be strong pressure for some sort of plan B to deal with climate change, some kind of geoengineering. And this is something which sort of some people like, which is nice technology, but this plan B, which is to be fatalistic about continuing dependence on fossil fuels, uh, but to combat its effects in some way, uh, does have its sort of dangers. It's feasible, for instance, to inject enough aerosols into the stratosphere to cool the world's climate. Indeed, what's scary is that this could be done by a single nation or even a single corporation. And there could be unintended effects and other consequences of rising CO2 emission like acidification aren't checked at all. Geoengineering would be a political nightmare because not all nations would want to turn down the thermostat the same way. And indeed the only beneficiaries would be lawyers. They'd have a bonanza if nations could litigate over bad weather. But there is incidentally a more benign form of uh, geoengineering, which is the subject of a recent National Academy report, and this is where uh, you try to directly extract the carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere, either sort of mechanically or by uh, um, uh, turning it into biomass, then burning the biomass and sequ sequestering the, the carbon. These are all possibilities, and they're better than the first kind of, of geoengineering, um, but I think the best hope is that the uh, uh, clean energy uh, um, uh, can project can advance fast. And it would be hard to think of a more uh, challenging and idealistic aim for young engineers uh, than to find ways of getting clean and affordable energy for the entire world. Well, those are two predictions that we can make. More crowded world, a warmer world. But of course other technologies which we depend on are advancing very fast and if we realize how unpredictable say the iPhone would have been even 25 years ago we've got to keep our minds open or at least ajar to completely unsuspected new things by 2050. But we do know what some of the trends are. In particular we know that advances in biotech offer prospects for improved health and enhanced food production. But the same research has some controversial aspects. Let me give just two examples. There were some experiments done in Wisconsin and also in Holland about uh, five years ago to show it was surprisingly easy to make the flu virus more virulent and more transmissible. <coughs> And the American federal government in 2014 stopped funding these experiments. It's sort of dangerous knowledge if this stuff escapes and if it, one knows how easy it can, can be. And the new CRISPR-Cas9 technique for gene editing has many benign uses, of course, we're familiar with them, but it can be used for so-called gene drive, where you try to make a particular species sterile. This has been used, I think, quite wisely to try and eliminate the kind of mosquito that carries the Zika virus. Uh, but there are some people in my country who want to use it to get rid of the, uh, the grey squirrel, uh, which some people think is a pest and they prefer the brown squirrel. I like them both equally, so I hope this uh, won't be done. But in any case, there is of course a risk of uh, uh, a runaway ecological uh, effect if you uh, tamper with the ecological balance, as has happened when uh, uh, species have been imported into Australia and they've had unexpected consequences. So we have to be careful about these new techniques. And the possibility to design new species by being able to, uh, um, uh, to, to uh, uh, scan the g genome and synthesize the genome is certainly on the cards. Back in the early days of DNA research, a group of biologists met at Asilomar, California and agreed guidelines on what experiments should and shouldn't be done. And this encouraging precedent has been followed recently to discuss developments such as those I've mentioned in the same spirit. But today, 40 years after Asilomar, the research community is far more broadly international 
and more influenced by commercial pressure. So I'd worry that whatever regulations are imposed on prudential grounds or ethical grounds can't be enforced worldwide any more than the drug laws can or the tax laws can. And that's a nightmare. Whereas an atomic bomb can't be built without large-scale special purpose facilities, biotech involves small-scale dual-use equipment. Indeed, biohacking is burgeoning even as a hobby and competitive game. And we know all too well that technical expertise doesn't guarantee balanced rationality. The global village will have its village idiots, but they'll have global range. We're familiar with such threats in cybertech, but the rising empowerment of tech-savvy groups or even individuals by biotech will likewise pose an intractable challenge, a challenge to governance, and will aggravate the tension between freedom, privacy, and security. These concerns are fairly near term, but let's now look ahead beyond 2050. On the bio front, we might expect two things. A better understanding of the combination of genes that determines key human characteristics and the ability to synthesize genomes that match these features. The great physicist Freeman Dyson conjectures a time when children will be able to design new species in the same way that he could make new chemicals with his chemistry set when he was a kid. Well, if it does become possible to, as it were, play God on a kitchen table, our ecology and even our species may not long survive unscathed. So let's hope that remains science fiction. So much for biotech, but about another transformative technology, robotics and AI. Here there's been exciting advance in what's called generalized machine learning. The company DeepMind famously achieved the feat of making a computer that beat the world champion in the game of Go. There is the world champion. And Carnegie Mellon University developed a machine that can bluff and calculate as well as the best human poker players. Well, of course, it's more than 20 years since IBM's Deep Blue computer beat Kasparov, the world chess champion. So this may not seem a big deal. But there's a big difference. The IBM computer was programmed in detail by expert players. In contrast, the machines that play Go, and now chess as well, are just given the rules, nothing else. And they become world class within a few hours because they can play against each other with immense speed and do 100,000 games in that time. And their designers don't themselves know how the machines make what are seemingly especially insightful moves. That was especially true in the case of the, uh, the Go player. And of course, it's the speed of computers, familiar from this diagram, which allows them to succeed by brute force methods. Not only in what I've mentioned, but in identifying dogs, cats, and human faces, they crunch through millions of images, not the way babies learn. And they learn to translate by reading millions of pages of, for example, multilingual European Union documents. Their boredom threshold is infinite. <laughs> and they succeed by reinforced learning on big training sets. But the question is, can they ever understand human behavior? This involves observing actual people in real homes and workplaces. And the machine would feel sensorily deprived by the slowness of real life, and will be bewildered. To quote Stuart Russell, the world expert on this subject, he sa says the computer could try all kinds of things. Scrambling eggs, stacking wooden blocks, chewing wires, poking its finger into electric outlets. But nothing would produce a strong enough feedback loop to convince the computer it was on the right track and lead it to the next necessary action. So it's hard to have a computer interact with the real complex world. And robots are still clumsier than a child in moving pieces on a real chessboard. They can't jump from tree to tree like a, a squirrel. Although Boston Dynamics has built a robot called Handel that can do somersaults, although not very elegantly. 
And another difference is that the Go playing computer used hundreds of kilowatts of power. But the brain of its human challenger used about 30 watts. That's about a light bulb. And could do many other things apart from play Go. But sensor technology, face recognition and so forth are advancing apace. <coughs> Robots won't just take over manual work. Indeed, plumbing and gardening will be among the hardest jobs to automate. But they take over routine legal work, medical diagnostics, and even surgery. And of course, as we all know, the big social and economic question is, will this new machine age be like earlier disruptive technologies, like the car, for instance, and generate as many jobs as they destroy? Or is it really different this time? The money earned by robots will surely generate huge wealth for an elite that owns or controls them. But I suggest in my book that to preserve a healthy society we require massive redistribution to ensure that everyone has at least a living wage. This shouldn't be a handout, but it should be provided by generating huge numbers of public service jobs where the human element is crucial looking after old people in particular, and also teaching assistants, gardeners in public parks, and things like that. This may be easier to do, I guess, in Scandinavia than in this country, where they accept a high tax in order to provide a good welfare state. But let's now look still further ahead. How human could robots become? If they could observe and interpret their environment as adeptly as we do, they certainly can't now, they'd be perceived as intelligent beings to which or to whom we can relate. And of course such machines pervade popular culture. So we'd have to ask, would we have an obligation towards them? We worry if our fellow humans and even some animals can't fulfil their natural potential. So should we feel guilty if our robots are underemployed or bored? And what if a machine develops a mind of its own? Would it stay docile or go rogue? If it could infiltrate the Internet of Things, it could manipulate the rest of the world. It may have goals utterly orthogonal to human wishes. Some AI pundits take this seriously and think that the field already needs guidelines just as biotech does. But others such as Rodney Brooks, the inventor of the Roomba vacuum cleaner, and Baxter, he thinks these concerns are premature. He thinks it will be a long time before artificial intelligence is a bigger worry than real stupidity. <coughs> but be that as it may, it's quite likely that society will be transformed by autonomous robots, even though the jury is out on whether they'll be idiot savants or display superhuman capabilities. And there's also disagreement about the route towards human level intelligence. Something we, could, we should emulate nature and reverse engineer the human brain. Others think that's as misguided as trying to design flying machines by imitating how birds fly. The futurologist Ray Kurzweil, who now works at Google, he argues that once machines have surpassed human capabilities, they could themselves design and assemble a new generation of even more powerful ones. An intelligence explosion. What some call the singularity. He thinks that humans could transcend biology by merging with computers. In old style spiritualist parlance, they would go over to the other side. But we would then confront the classic philosophical problem of personal identity. If your brain were downloaded into a machine, in what sense would it still be you? Should you feel relaxed about your body then being destroyed? And what would happen if several clones were made of you? And is the input into our sense organs and physical interactions with the real external world so essential to our being that this transition would be not only abhorrent but also impossible? These are ancient conundrums for philosophers but they may soon be relevant to practical ethicists. Kurzweil, incidentally, is worried that the singularity may not happen in his lifetime. So when he dies, he wants his body frozen, 
his blood replaced by liquid nitrogen until immortality is on offer and then he can be resurrected into some post-human world. I was surprised to find incidentally that three academics in my country had gone in for cryonics. Two have paid the full whack and one of them the cut price for just having his head frozen. <laughs> I was glad that they were all from Oxford and not from my university <laughs> because I told them I would rather end my days in an English churchyard than in a California refrigerator. <laughs> but of course more seriously research on ageing is being seriously prioritised. But will the benefits be incremental or is ageing a disease that can be cured? Dramatic life extension would plainly be a real wild card in population projections. But it is least surely on the cards that human beings, their mentality and their physique, may become malleable through the deployment of genetic modification and cyborg technology. Moreover, this future evolution, a kind of secular intelligent design, would take only centuries in contrast to the thousands of centuries needed for Darwinian evolution. And this is a game changer. When we admire the literature and artefacts that have survived from antiquity, we feel an affinity across a time gulf for thousands of years with those ancient artists and their civilizations. But we can have zero confidence that the dominant intelligence of a few centuries from now will have any emotional resonance with us even though they may have some algorithmic understanding of how we behaved. And now I turn briefly to another technology and my special interest, space. I'll argue that it's there that some of these changes will happen fastest and should worry us less. During this century, the whole solar system will be explored by swarms of miniaturised probes, far more advanced than the wonderful Cassini experiment designed in the 1990s, which explored Saturn and its moons. Or the European probe Rosetta, which landed a little robot on a comet. Or the NASA probe, which transmitted back pictures of Pluto, 20,000 times further away than the moon. Think back to the computers and phones of the 1990s when all these three probes were designed and realise how much better we can do today. The next step will be deployment in space of robotic fabricators which can build large structures, for instance giant telescopes with huge gossamer thin mirrors assembled under zero gravity. Well, what about manned space flight? The practical case for this gets ever weaker with each advance in robots and miniaturization. So will it have a resurgence? It's nearly 50 years since Neil Armstrong's One Small Step. I cherish this photo signed for me a few years ago by seven of the Apollo astronauts. In the 1960s, there was of course a space race against the Russians. And once that race was won, there was no motivation for continuing the requisite expenditure, which was at that time 4% of the US federal budget. Had that expenditure continued, there would have been footprints on Mars long before today. Well, hundreds more, as we know, have ventured into space, but anticlimactically they've done no more than circle the Earth in low orbit, many in the International Space Station. And this really doesn't even make the newspapers unless, for instance, the loo doesn't work or someone like the Canadian astronaut Chris Hatfield plays his guitar and sings. Very little of practical value to justify the 12-figure cost of the space station has emerged. Will there be any inspirational Apollo star projects? There's no doubt that NASA's Curiosity, travelling across a giant Martian crater, there are its uh, track marks about a quarter of the way up, you can see. That may miss startling discoveries that no human geologist could overlook. But machine learning is advancing fast. In contrast, the gap between manned and unmanned missions in cost remains large. NASA's manned program, ever since Apollo, 
has been impeded by public and political pressure into being extremely risk-averse. The Space Shuttle failed twice in 135 launches. Astronauts or test pilots would willingly accept a 2% risk. But the shuttle was unwisely promoted as being safe for civilians. And each of those two failures was a sort of natural trauma and caused a three-year hiatus in the programme, while costly but limited effects were made to reduce the risk still further. Because of this safety culture, NASA will confront political obstacles in achieving any grand goal within a feasible budget. China, of course, has the resources, the dear East government, and maybe the willingness to undertake an Apollo-style programme. And if they want to do this, then they would have to go to Mars, because they wouldn't be asserting parity with the US if they did something the US had done 50 years earlier. They've got to take a, a further great leap forward, as it were. But leaving aside the Chinese, I think the future of manned spaceflight lies with privately funded adventurers prepared to participate in a cut-price programme far riskier than Western nations could impose on publicly supported civilians. Elon Musk's SpaceX and Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin will soon offer orbital flights to paying customers. And SpaceX has recently signed up a Japanese billionaire to go with a few friends on a voyage round the backside of the moon. A five-day voyage going further from Earth than any humans before. And uh, Dennis Tito wants with a, a bigger rocket to send people on a journey round the, to Mars and back. That's 500 days. And he says the ideal crew will be a middle-aged couple, happy to be cooped up together for that length of time and old enough not to care about a radiation dose. <laughs> well, uh, these are all uh, possibilities. These private enterprise ventures bringing a Silicon Valley culture into a domain long dominated by NASA and the aerospace conglomerates uh, is, I think, something to be encouraged. The future role of the national agencies will be attenuated, becoming more akin to an airport than to an airline. So were I an American, I would only support NASA's unmanned programs, arguing that the private enterprise companies should front manned missions as cut-price, high-risk ventures. And there will be many volunteers, some perhaps even accepting one-way tickets. In fact, Elon Musk himself has says that he hopes to die on Mars, but not on impact. <laughs> <laughs> and the phase space tourism should be avoided, because that lulls people into believing these things are routine when they're not. But by 2100, courageous pioneers in the mould of, say, the late Steve Fawcett, or the guy who fell supersonically from high altitude balloon, they may have established bases on Mars, independent from the Earth, or maybe on asteroids. But don't ever expect mass emigration from the Earth. No way in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. And here I disagree with Musk and with my late colleague Stephen Hawking. I think it's a dangerous delusion to think that space offers an escape from Earth's problems. Dealing with climate change on Earth is a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. There's no planet B for ordinary risk-averse people. Nonetheless, I think we should cheer on these brave space adventurers because they will have a pivotal role in spearheading the post-human future and determining what happens in the 22nd century and beyond. And this is why the Martian pioneers will be ill-adapted to their new habitat. So they'll have a more compelling incentive than those of us on Earth to redesign themselves. They'll harness the super powerful genetic and cyborg technologies that will be developed in the next few decades. Techniques that will be, be, I hope, restrained here on Earth on grounds of prudence and ethics. But the settlers on Mars will be far beyond the clutches of the regulators, and we should surely wish them well in modifying their progeny to adapt to alien environments. So it's these spacefaring adventurers, not those of us comfortably adapted to life on Earth, who will spearhead the post-human era, evolving within a few centuries into a new species. 
And if they make the transition to fully inorganic intelligences, they won't need an atmosphere. And they may prefer zero G. So it's in deep space, not in Earth, not on Earth, nor even on Mars, that non-biological brains may develop powers that humans can't even imagine. Well, we talk about sort of superhuman intelligences, but what about consciousness? Another philosophical conundrum is whether consciousness is special to the wet organic brains of humans, apes and dogs, or so would it be that the electronic intelligences, even if they seem superhuman, will still lack self-awareness or inner life? Or, on the other hand, is consciousness something which emerges in any sufficiently complex network? Well, some say this is irrelevant and semantic, like asking whether a submarine swims. But I don't think it is, because this question crucially affects how we would react to a far future of the kind I've sketched. If the machines are zombies, we would not accord their experiences the same value as ours, and the post-human future would seem bleak. But if they are conscious, we should surely welcome the prospect of their future hegemony. A word about the very far future. The huge timescales of the evolutionary past, as in its time chart, are part of common culture outside fundamentalist circles. But most people, although happy with this, tend to somehow feel that we humans are the culmination of the evolutionary tree. And that doesn't seem credible to astronomers. Astronomers know that the sun is less than halfway through its life. It's got six billion years to go. And the expanding universe may go on forever. And to quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. So we may not even be at the halfway stage of evolution. So if life had originated only on the Earth, it need not remain a trivial feature of the cosmos. Humans could jumpstart a diaspora, whereby ever more complex intelligence spreads through the whole galaxy. There's plenty of time for that to happen. And this raises the next question, which is perhaps the question that uh, astronomers are most often asked. Is there life out there already? I think the answer is we just don't know. Nobody knows. Some people think they know. I mean, I get letters from people who say they've met the aliens, they've been abducted by them. And I write back to these people saying, do they really think that if the aliens had made a huge effort to come here, they'd just make a corn circle, meet one or two well-known cranks and go again, away again? It seems unlikely. And I tell these people also to write to each other and not write to me. <laughs> um, but I think we know some things. We know that uh, there's no uh, complex life anywhere in our solar system. There might be simple life on Mars under the ice of Enceladus, the moon of Jupiter. But if we look further afield to the realm of the stars, things now look much more hopeful. Because one of the great discoveries of the last decade or two has been that most stars in the sky are orbited by retinues of planets, rather like the sun is. And about one star in six has an Earth-sized planet orbiting around it. And Extraordinary has been found. There's a miniature solar system has been found where there's a star about 1% the brightest of the sun and seven planets orbiting around it with years lasting between one and a half days for the innermost one and the outermost one now known to be 18.8 .8 days. This is a miniature solar system. And the three outermost of these planets are in the so-called habitable zone where water could exist. They'd be very spectacular places to live um, but uh, um, uh, it's not clear there's life on any of them. Indeed, we don't yet know how likely it was that life emerged on the Earth. We know it did happen, but we don't know what the odds were. We understand biological evolution, but we don't know what caused the transition from complex chemistry to the first replicating, metabolizing things we'd call alive. But fortunately, people are working on that. 
And I think in 10 years' time, we will have a clear idea of how life began on Earth and whether the chemistry is unique or whether we should look at other chemistries. And another thing we may have is some information about some of these other uh, um, planets around other stars. We might have enough light from them uh, to be able to get a spectrum and see if there's any evidence for oxygen or any non-equilibrium effect that might indicate they have a biosphere. Well, that's hard because um, let's suppose that um, there were some aliens who were looking at our Earth and our sun from, say, 50 light years away. What would they see? They would see the sun as an ordinary star. They would see the Earth as, in Carl Sagan's nice phrase, a pale blue, pale blue dot lying very close in the sky to its star, our sun, and billions of times fainter. But if they looked very closely and carefully and had a big enough telescope, they could learn quite a bit about our Earth. Because a shade of blue would be a bit different depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Asia was facing them. So they could infer there were continents and oceans, the length of a day, and something about the climate and seasons. We can't do that yet, but 10 years from now we might be able to. And one instrument that will help, and I can, if I'm a European chauvinist, let me plug this. This is a, a telescope being built in Chile with a mirror, a mosaic mirror, 39 meters across. That's probably all, almost twice the width of this, this room. And uh, uh, Europeans aren't very imaginative in their nomenclature. It's called the Extremely Large Telescope, the ELT. Um, and this will be able to gather enough light to actually do these sorts of analyses of other planets um, around other stars. So that, that'll be an exciting area in, in subject. And of course, this will be evidence for some sort of vegetation or simple life. Um, what about intelligent life? Uh, uh, SETI, well here, of course, uh, we don't know what the odds are. Um, I think it's worth a search. In fact, I chair a committee uh, for a project funded by Yuri Milner, uh, a Russian based in California who's spending 10 million a year to buy time on radio telescopes and develop instruments to deepen the search for some sort of evidence for an artificial transmission. We're not holding our breath for success, but it's such a fascinating issue that it's worth having, uh, having some attempt. If I might venture one prediction, is that if we detect anything which is artificial, it won't be from a civilization like us. It will be so from some electronic machine created by some long dead civilization. I say that because my scenario for what happened on Earth is nearly four billion years of evolution, then a few millennia of technological evolution, and then the machines take over and they go off into space for billions more years. So we would be unlikely to catch another civilization in a sliver of time when it was like ours. Well, um, fortunately, I don't have uh, enough time to go into any deeper speculations, uh, so let me instead finish off by uh, focusing back <coughs> closer to the, to the here and now. If I get my, if I can find my, my notes, yes, I can. Um, so, I think what we can say is that We are going to have a problem this century, even though this century is, uh, is, is crucial and only one century in the 45 million of years run. And, and that's because our society is developing very fast, it's very brittle, it's very vulnerable, it's very interconnected. Our cities will be paralyzed without electricity, air travel can spread a pandemic worldwide within days, <coughs> causing the worst havoc in the mega cities of the developing world. And of course, um, un un unlike previous generations, um, we have expectations that we can cure pandemics. And so I think uh, even though in the Black Death half the population died, the rest went on uh, fatalistically, now once hospitals were overwhelmed, then I think there'll be social breakdown. We have to worry about things like that now. And I think Although we fret on Julie about very small risks, like carcinogens in food, train crashes, plane crashes, etc., we are in denial about these extreme risks. And uh, I'd like, before I finish, to propagandize and say that uh, we need to use our expertise in universities uh, to study scenarios so that we can decide which of these uh, uh, technological risks can be dismissed 
as science fiction and which are real enough that we ought to do something about them in order to minimize them. So a wise mantra is that the unfamiliar is not the same as the improbable. And my theme has been that even in the concertina time span that astronomers envisage, billions of years into the past and into the future, this century may be a defining era when we can jump start to electronic intelligences or where we can, through our follies, foreclose that immense potential. How can scientists concerned about these issues influence policymakers? The trouble is that even the best politicians focus mainly on the urgent and the parochial. The European politician Jean-Claude Juncker said in a different context that we know what to do but we don't know how to get re-elected when we do it. And this is an endemic frustration for those who've been official scientific advisors to government. To attract politicians' attention, you must get headlined in the press and fill their inboxes. And that's hard to do with long-term global issues, things like climate change or things which are improbable but can't be dismissed. That's why I think scientists can have more influence, more leverage indirectly by campaigning so that the public and the media amplify their voices. Here I think the world's religions can help and the media. Just to give one example, uh, for climate change, we know that uh, uh, the papal encyclical in 2015 had a big effect on public opinion in uh, Latin America, Africa and East Asia in the lead up to the climate uh, summit in Paris. Um, and to take an example, in the UK, there's been a huge rise in concern about plastics in the ocean in the last two years, generated more than anything, anything else by the uh, Blue Planet 2 BBC radio television programs, uh, which had an iconic picture of an albatross returning from its wanderings and uh, um, coughing up for its infants not the nourishment they needed, but some plastics. And this, I think, is a sort of iconic image which has affected people, just like the famous one of the uh, polar bear on the little ice floe. So I think uh, we can, as individuals, uh, not only um, uh, help to mould public opinion, but also if we're experts, we can focus a bit more on these issues. The spaceship Earth is hurtling through the void. Its passengers are anxious and fractious. Their life support system is vulnerable to disruption and breakdowns. But at the moment, there's too little planning, too little horizon scanning. And, of course, we do need to think in this context globally and rationally and long-term, empowered by 21st century technology, but guided by values that science alone can't provide. And I've got to give the last word to one of my scientific heroes, the eloquent immunologist Peter Medawar. I quote, The bells are told for mankind are like the bells of alpine cattle. They're attached to our own necks, and it must be our fault if they don't make a tuneful and melodious sound. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. That was fantastic. Um, we've got time for a few quick questions, if anybody would like to ask anything. Yes, question on the back. In this country, science seems to have been devalued, if not thrown out altogether by the administration. Is this just an anomaly here in the U.S.? How does Europe? Well, I mean, uh, I. Uh forbear from commenting on the American political situation. Um, I, I think um, th there is clearly a problem. Um, and uh, I, I think um, it's important to remedy it because we don't want everyone to be experts. But I think it is important that since more and more of the issues that we have to vote on have a scientific dimension, whether they're regarding uh, um, climate, environment, or health, People need to have enough feel for the issues, not to be bamboozled, and to, to be able to make an intelligent judgment and not just be affected by slogans. And I think this is sort of part, part of education. Um, and of course, there's a special role that falls on scientists themselves uh, when there is a discovery which has some sort of uh, 
uh, impacts which could be good and could be bad. Um, in my book, I sort of highlight uh, the people who were involved in the Manhattan Project, many great figures who I was privileged to know in their old age, like Hans Bethe and Joe Rotblatt, etc. Uh, they felt they had an obligation in their later years to try to harness the powers they'd helped unleash. Um, and uh, uh, we need people with that sort of mindset now uh, to, uh, to warn on all the other technologies, be it AI, bio, and cyber, um, and uh, ensure that if they have benign applications, those are indeed developed, and if they have dangerous implications, uh, everything is done to minimize the risk of those happening. Uh, so I think that's, that, that is a problem. Um, uh, I won't comment on the particular US situation. <coughs> It doesn't seem that, you know, the advances in astronomy have given us any better perspective on our commonality of humanity rather than our differences, say our religious differences. Do you anticipate that, you know, more widespread appreciation of astronomy issues could, in fact, engender more, more of a, less of a we versus they talk than we have? Well, of course, um, uh, all science apart from its uh, practical value, is a universal culture. Protons and proteins are the same the world over, and that's why scientists can straddle boundaries of faith and of nationality and ideology more easily than other professionals. So they have that advantage, which sometimes they exploit, sometimes they don't. And of course, of all the sciences, I suppose you could say astronomy is the most universal, because throughout history, humans have stared up at the vault of heaven, as it were, and interpreted it in different ways. So it's the one part of our environment which has been shared by all humans worldwide throughout history. So I like to say that uh, astronomy, as well as being a fundamental science, is the most uh, universal and grandest environmental science. And so that, I think, has some effect. It emphasizes uh, something that we all have in common. Yeah, it's a question up back and then one in the front. Yeah. Yes, it seems to me that in uh, some European uh, actually audiences, scientific thought has more impact on the average citizen. I would think about perhaps in France, uh, and uh, perhaps in Germany, perhaps in England. Uh, could you perhaps, if you see any perhaps uh, uh, issue of communication, uh, could you offer any guidance to the American uh, uh, scientists of how they can reach more effectively the public, and through the public perhaps the politicians? Well, it's presumptuous of me, but I think um, um, individuals can make a difference. I mean, m most causes are led by charismatic individuals, and Carl Sagan was an example of someone who got through to a huge worldwide audience, and people like that uh, can have far more influence on the public than any uh, official political advisor to a minister or even a president. So I think we want to encourage and respect people of that kind. I mean, uh, in this country you didn't even make uh, Sagan a member of the National Academy, which is a very negative signal. And I hope that, that people will be more um, enlightened now for his, his successors. There's a question. Yeah. Um, thank you. Just somehow it's amazing. Um, what do you think the IMF and the World Bank could do better to work with private sector real estate developers that are doing clean renewable energy? working on smart city development in Africa to meet the rising demands. Yeah. You see what's happening in China, mm -hmm. more and more energy is being demanded, we're running out of oil and coal as we're saying. Yes. What do you think the IMF in particular and the World Bank could do to help facilitate more PPAs, get more BGs, SGs, yes. to be able to facilitate more yes. projects? Well, again, I speak with diffidence, but I would have thought if they can help with uh, funding for the uh, development of clean energy, uh, and networks and all that, that would be helpful. But I, I think the, the problem of Africa is really, really serious because the population is going to, to double between now and 2050, and it could be on the highest UN projection, it doubles again between 2050 and 2100, in which case the population will be 4 billion, and even Nigeria will have a population equal to Europe and the North America combined. This will be a huge redistribution. And if they are trapped in poverty, but they know what they're missing, this is a very dangerous situation. And what I would suggest has happened there is a grander version of something which a British economist called Paul Collier 
has suggested in the context of the Syrian refugees. He's noted they really want to come to Europe, but what we should do is in Europe, we should build factories and other ways in which they can earn a living, say in Jordan or somewhere like that. And that seems to be a good solution to the uh, Syrian uh, refugee crisis. And on a mega scale, I suspect that something like that is going to have to be done in order to uh, uh, avoid the a widening of the gap between Africa and the rest of the world. Because the other problem Africa has is that it can't develop in the way that the uh, Asian tigers did by uh, offering cheaper labor for manufacturing than uh, Europe and North America, because that's done by robots anyway. So that ladder has been knocked down. And so that'll make it even harder. So uh, I would have thought the biggest challenge is going to be to uh, help um, Africa. Um, and uh, um, if we don't do that, then I think the, uh, we should look at the future with foreboding. How would you address the criticism that says certain technologies should not be pursued for personal, moral, religious, whatever reasons? Yes. How would you address such a criticism? Well, I would say it's a, it's a serious it's a serious issue, but um, what I would say is that, um, first of all, you can't always predict beforehand what's going to be discovered, uh, still less how it's going to be used. I mean, to take an example, the inventor of the laser had no idea it would be used as a weapon or in DVDs or for eye surgery. Um, so you normally don't, don't know, um, but, uh, but I think um, one does need to be somewhat cautious. I mean, there's a precautionary principle which says we should be very cautious about doing something which uh, has unpredictable effects. Um, but uh, on the other hand, if we didn't uh, continue to develop technology as we had in, in the last century, we would be in a worse state today. We couldn't have feed the present world had it not been for development in the last 50 years. Um, so I think um, we, we d d there are some specific things, and I gave the example of the uh, experiments on the influenza virus, where temporarily there was a break put on fun funding support for that. I think it's reasonable to um, uh, slant funding towards things where there's an expectation of a positive development, but it's very hard to say beforehand uh, that um, uh, some technology or some science is going to have bad effects and no countervailing good effects. And of course, it's not clear that you can stop the developments anyway. You can perhaps uh, slow them down by not funding them, but you can't stop them. So I think it's a serious issue, um, and, uh, uh, if, but it's very hard to have so-called selective relinquishment of, uh, uh, of technologies uh, by identifying which are the bad ones. Oh, one last question. Um, I had a question uh, with regards to um, the different scenarios you were talking about with climate change, um, either the development of clean technology or the Plan B yeah, scenarios. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious what, what, if you have any sense what the timeline is for needed for developing clean energy technology versus when you would need to take Plan B approach. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the IPCC report just in the last month or so uh, uh, made the point that uh, if you want to stick to 1.5 degrees mean temperature rise, we've got to act pretty quickly. And I think most people think it's going to be very difficult uh, to meet that kind of target in any way. Um, but I think if the political will was there, then we could clearly meet a two degree target. But the trouble is I'm skeptical about the political will, and that's why I would emphasise the um, uh, R&D to clean energy because I think there's more support for that. Just to tell one anecdote, um, I uh, was a supporter of what was then called the Apollo programme, now called Mission Innovation, um, before the Paris conference and I went on the BBC programme to talk about it. And the BBC always wants to get someone uh, to rubbish you, whatever your topic is, uh, to have a debate. And uh, they they picked um, Vaughan Lomberg, who probably known here as Skeptical Environmentalist, I mentioned him earlier. Um, uh, but but um, as I knew and they didn't know, he completely agreed with me. He didn't think that the uh, uh, carbon tax and things like that were effective, uh, but he was all in favour of high technology solutions. And that indicates that I think there's broader support for that kind of approach, um, where the rich countries, the high-tech countries will benefit and the Indians will benefit too. So I think that's uh, not only the most attractive scenario, but I think the most realistic politically. 
we'll have to leave it there. I just want to uh, quickly close by um, thanking Martin one more time. The, um, there is a sort of Oxford-Cambridge rivalry, you may have noticed <laughs> in his comments earlier. Uh, but even at Oxford University, I mean, we regard Cambridge as one of our early spin-outs. Uh, right. But um, even at Oxford University, uh, when he came to speak, he was described as the wisest person in the whole of the United Kingdom, <laughs> which with Brexit doesn't seem so great. But anyway. <laughs> right, uh, yeah, would yeah. you all join me in thanking Martin yeah, yeah. for an excellent... Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.